going to climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Hi there. Welcome to the Forbidden Limb Podcast. I'm your host, Richard New. This is Jeremy Commander with me and Brian Hink. And this is going to be How Do You Know Your Game Is Finished Part 2. Uh, let's get right back in where we left off last week. I'm going to throw a resource this time. So because we are talking about uh, getting feedback and getting people to be honest, I also want to, here it is, encourage you to think about doing written feedback. And the reason, the reason I think this is a good test of, of your game is ready is, again, people are very polite face-to-face -face or verbal or conversation. And people are actually going to be more honest on a written anonymous survey than they are verbally or face-to-face. -face. So uh, one of our local game designers, uh, Candy, Candy Weber, she is a huge proponent of written feedback for this reason. And if you're a designer, you're starting out, you're not going, what, what kind of feedback should I ask for? What questions should I ask? I'm going to say that you should go to unpub.net and get the unpub feedback form. This is one of the best feedback forms I've seen. It's very simple, very straightforward, and it's going to give you honest, objective feedback about your game. And people are going to be more honest when they fill this out than they are to your face, even if you're sitting right next to them or if you're in the other room. The only problem with that, I guess I would say, is that it's more work to... It is. And, it is. And, no, and I know I would, rather, um, I would rather tell a designer what I think of their game and explain it. And if they hand me a l large worksheet, which I've gotten before too, and say, you know, say how many victory points you had and how many of this creature you had. Too much. It's too just much. like, oh, really? It's not just one, one side of a sheet. There's one that, side of a sheet, and yeah. the most of those on there is like three lines. What's yeah. one thing you would change? And and it's it, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, if it's too much, I've gotten. Hey, can you do some written feedback? Sure. I got a four-page form. Like, ah, oh, what did I what did I get into? I'm sorry. I, when I said <laughs> sure, what I meant. <laughs> 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 you, you have to decide what's best for your crowd and your game. Are you just yes. going to do audio feedback? Are you just going to do face to face? Are you going to do written? But if you're if you're not getting really good, useful feedback, or you oh my game's done, no one seems to have any complaints about it. Throw the written feedback at it and see if you get more honest answers. See yeah. if you uncover something you did not verbally. That's a good way to do it too, because when it's anonymous written feedback, you you know they give a form, you read it the next day. Probably, um, but then you can't pull anything out of that. When somebody says like, you know, I didn't like the way um, you know uh, the the card drawing was or the hand management was. You know, you know, you can write that down, but then like, wait, what? You know, if I'm reading this the next day, what did you not like about it? You know, mm -hmm. if they're right there, then I can ask, I can pull out more from them. It's like, what? Did you Again, for the designer, yeah, yeah. I encourage you to use a smartphone. If you after your yes. you test your prototype. You know, just lay it down into the voice recorder. I'm just yep. going to record some the, the voice, what your, our feedback, so I can review it later. I'm not going to publish it or anything like that. Just, just this helps me remember what we talk about. And I, and I listen. I go back and I listen to all those recordings, and I'll remember a lot of stuff that I've forgotten about. Or people will say, oh, you know, I totally, I'd written down the other three things this guy said, but I forgot to write that one thing down. Yep. Or I misinterpreted it, and I hear the audio afterwards. And it's a very, a very useful tool to listen to that. And it also lets me know if I'm running too long asking for feedback. Okay. My audio achievement recording is more than like five or six minutes like oh I really need to wrap this up now I, I, I may have gone too long if your feedback for the game is longer than the game <laughs> that's yeah. happened before that's happened before yeah, right. in those conversations one thing too that's a little bit it, it really depends on on your type of game like you mentioned as well too because like you know the games that that I'm I usually design are more social games so right. I don't care as much about you know there aren't like points to balance in you know Part, there isn't a lot of moving pieces. It's usually I want to see how people are experiencing the game, and then I will maybe make little modifications here or there. But I just want to get the general, you know, idea. The you know, how how are you liking it? What aren't you liking? But uh, more of a, a long longer game, or more of a euro game, or more of a there are many games out there that would rely more on um, I guess um, quantitative data. You should. I mean, you absolutely. Should. If your game is like a points game or more of a euro game, you really should track. The point spread. Our games blow out. Does so one guy blow everybody away before? Just for clarity's sake, can you tell me what uh, what you mean by Euro game? Oh, yes. versus Ameritrack. Good call. Good call. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use uh, Kevin Nunn's definition of a Euro game versus an Ameritrash game. That's the best one I've heard so far. Kevin Nunn's designed a whole bunch of games. A very well known designer. Uh, and so his 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 definition is such: in a Euro game, something random happens. And then you make a decision based on that. So think Settlers Catan. We roll the dice and some resources are produced. Now I get some resources. What am I going to trade? What am I going to build? In an Ameritrash game, 
theme and randomness are much higher up in the priorities. So in a Meritrash game, you decide to do something, make a decision, then something random happens. So the classic example here is risk. I'm going to invade this city. Let's roll and see if I get it. Oh, I'm going to invade this country. Or, you know, any war game, I'm going to try to shoot this guy. Well, roll three D6s and see if you hit him. And so that's, that's kind of a Meritrash game. The, the randomness is, is higher. My decision may be invalidated by the randomness or the luck. And in a Euro game, uh, my, de my decisions are not invalidated by the randomness. The randomness happens up front. Then I make a decision based on that. Okay. So when you're talking about uh, the numbers game for uh, Euro games, if you're building a Euro, you need, you, maybe not early on, but when you, you've gotten to the point where you've written a rule and you've written the rules down and you've done a, you've done a blind play test, you need to start tracking your game. You need to have a spreadsheet with all the games and the point spread. Because if, if, if every game that you play, like two guys are ahead and two guys are way behind, that's going to be a bad experience for people if they're like the, that people have double the score they do. You need to have a catch-up mechanic or balance the game more. Or you want to see that, well, you know what? The water strategy always wins. I'm looking at my spreadsheet, and I have 10 games on here, and water won seven of those 10 games. Maybe water is too powerful. Maybe I need to rebalance that. Yeah, and Excel spreadsheets, I think, are the best for me. Like, I always have an iPad with, like, every possible piece of data in the game, you know? And then I can do that as people are playing. I can be there, you know, putting in, you know, how many of this, they get, you know, this much wheat and this much stone. And, you know, I can be putting that in there while they play the game. And then I can be tracking that. Or that's the great thing about video, you know, recording it. You can look at it afterwards. You can just look at it afterwards, and you can you can take the data out of it that way. Or even audio, you can, you can say it. Yeah. So, so Richard had 53 points, yep. and he ended the game with uh, 5 fire, 2 water, and 10 wood, and it looks like he went for the wood strategy. Uh, and then yep. later when you play like the audio, you've got that, that data, you know what's going on. But you do need to put it into a spreadsheet so you can, you know, or a database even, you know, some way to, to so you can look at that data, you know, in a, in a, at a summary level, so you can make some decisions based on it. I'm lucky that I have a, a design partner who's very good at that. So for, for Pass the Paint, we tracked every card someone wound up with and their score. Uh, and it's a drafting game. So every card they ended the game with and what their score was, and we tracked that for about 200 games. And then we fed that spreadsheet into a math computer program he wrote and analyzed the game and rebalanced it based off that. Not everybody can do that. that that's very lucky to have my design partner has a PhD in math. So right, right. that's a great benefit for me. And I've, I've done that before, too, with some of my games where yeah. you know, I can just create a, an application that will si simulate a game, and I can play it millions and millions of times to see what you know how things balance out. It's very useful. Like. You, if you don't uh, have that ability, uh, <laughs> would you recommend just start scaling back one at a time or uh, like small increments until it balances? Or or find someone who's really good with numbers so that they can figure it out. Like I think your Franklin, your you know your design partner is really good at that. But you could also you know ask a friend or even you know pay someone to do it to look at your game and then and then. Uh, get it down to the numbers and you know come up with some formulas for how things should work and how scoring should work but i mean it's so critical if you i mean i've seen a lot of designers who don't do that and they just kind of do it by their gut and a lot of times that will fail and there'll be there'll be um, things you can uh, like optimal strategies where you just you have to play this way every single time to win and and, if, and unless you can balance those numbers so and you may get someone who has a good feel for that just to kind of look at your data or look at your rules and point out hey this looks like this might be a problem uh, or you might be able to make a trade. I've made trades before where someone did some like quantitative stuff for my game, and I did some graphic design. They, they have like an index card game. So we'll tell you what, I'll make a template for all those cards, splash some clip art or some images in there, and give you a file, a PDF, and a sheet, uh, and a source file, to, so you have a nicer looking game if you'll do this other work for me. You might be able to make a trade with another designer to make get that done. Can you uh, give some examples of, uh, of an Unpub or Protospiel if you may? Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> so there, there are two organizations that are just like pretty loose, not for profit organizations, and their job is to promote the playtesting and development of games. So one of them is uh, Protospiel.org, uh, and uh, Dave, here we go. There's a uh, Dave Witcher there. Uh, he organizes that, and there's Protospiel's now several places around the country. Uh, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin just ran their first one a few weeks ago, and a Protospiel event is. A bunch of game designers get together and they rent out some space somewhere. So like at, at uh, Madison, they rent out the conference room at like a Ramada hotel. Uh, and then they come together and play each other's prototype games for two or three days uh, and or try to attract players to come in and play those games as well. 
And many times a publisher will go to those events and go shopping for a game. It's a way for a publisher to play a whole bunch of prototypes in just a few days and see if there's anything they want to pick up. Uh, the other organization that does that is uh, Unpub, and that's run by uh, Daryl Louder, uh, at GetLouder on Twitter. Uh, and so Unpub had the feedback form I mentioned earlier. That, that's really a very nice feedback form, a great way to, to start with a feedback form. Unpub, uh, they do Unpub minis, and they do a big Unpub on the East Coast every year. Same kind of idea, designers can win. Unpub does, I think, one thing a little better than Portskill does is their formula is really designed to bring in players. Well, they want to have a, a, a high player to designer ratio. So they have lots of players. I went to a protest field once, and there was a lot of people there, you know, more than 50, uh, and at, uh, it was 90% game designers. So it's very hard to get your game to the table. So you sit down and you go, oh, what game should we play? Well, I want to play my game. I want to play my game. I want to play my game. <laughs> You're like, all right. So really, you have to do kind of this round robin thing, and you play each other's games. So you kind of get into a table of guys, and you play each other's games as kind of a courtesy to each other. Uh, but then the, the guy busts out. One of the guys has that two-hour euro, and you right. slog through it, and yep. it runs to three hours, and you're like, ah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that can be very, very challenging. But I find that the feedback from other game designers is is much more honest. It's much more it can be much more objective. It can be more. Um, Incisive. It can be more precise. You can say, you know, this mechanic here. If you keep it this way, it's going to, you're going to have a classic problem where people are going to figure out they can do this and exploit that. And then you go, ah, oh, you know, so and so game also has that problem. And that insight from those, I mean, it, it's it's really a harsh acid test. If you're not good at getting feedback, you're going to have a hard time because every game designer is going to Monday morning quarterback your game to death. And they're going to they're going to you could take you could take ticket to ride to a pro school event. And at least half the game designers would hate it, oh, yeah. <laughs> and they would, they would rip it up. But well, but I I've also heard from a lot of people who have who have created a game, and you know they've they've thought, oh I think this is done, I think we're ready to go, and then they bring it to like an on pub event, and they're just like, yeah I I got a bunch of feedback from you know from from people who really know what they're talking about, and it was that I made so many changes, you know, and but my game was so much better. In a positive way, yeah. It is in a positive way, but yeah. it's also you know. It's um, it's your game will probably be torn apart there, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so that that's yeah. And it kind of takes your game to a, a, the next level. A lot of people they they come and they bring their event their game to a pro school or event, and it, it does get blown up the first day, say Friday, and then Saturday they come they, that night they go home and they make a bunch of changes, they change it up, and or they bring spare components with them, and they're, they're markering things, they're changing it. Saturday it tests better. Sunday they do it again, and even after the three day process, they may have gained enough feedback and changes to be worth weeks or months of development time at home in just those three days. They've, they've taken the game so far. And if the, if the event is good at pulling in outside players, I ran a, a joint Unplugged Protospiel event in San Jose, and we got about 170 players to show up on top of the 30 designers. Awesome. So that was you know a really good player That's to designer perfect. ratio. Yeah. This gives you a lot of the benefits of remote blind playtesting. Because now these people come and they sit down and they play your game, and they don't know you from a hole in the wall. They, they don't know you. And so they're, because they don't know you, they don't have a relationship, they're not in a, a certain social setting. They're, they're, honest, they're a lot more honest about their feedback for that game, especially after they've done a couple games. They keep getting asked for mm -hmm. feedback, and they see another designer sitting next to them and unload on that game. Like, oh, I can say whatever I want. Okay. Uh, and so that can be almost the same benefits of remote blind playtest, but in a, a short time span. And now it, so many games that weekend. That was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> and, and now Unpub is uh, they ran a Kickstarter, so they're they're getting kind of more established. They have these kits that they send out to yes. so that you know you you have their, so you say I want to run a, a an Unpub in my in my town, um, and you get a little kit that has you know the, those forms that you you had. Um, you suggested, and, and I'm not sure what else they have in there, but they, they have printable materials. Unpub Unpub has a database, uh, and so for Unpub. You can, uh, you, if you put your games in, you, you take it on a pub, and then a publisher is searching for a kind of game, they can go look in the unpub database. You can make it private or public. It also forces you as a designer to really define your game. Because when you're doing that database entry, you've got to think about, how do I explain this game? You know, and, and how do I answer these questions? Which is a, a, a good way of doing it. Uh, and, and they're very supportive. They're giving you some ideas of how other people have done unpub. They're going to help you get you started in, in doing that. i got to throw the plug in for a... Uh, BoardGameBuilders.com, that's the website for the Unpub Protospiel. We're going to do another one in uh, April of next year. Okay. So look out for that, everybody. <laughs> um, oh, and there's one more benefit of going to a Unpub or Protospiel, uh, is in both cases, 
they have these little tags, first field tested, unpub tested, and it may not seem like a big deal, but if I'm a publisher and I'm looking at potential games to pick up, and on the box or on the sell sheet, we'll talk about sell sheets in the future, uh, it has tested it, unpub, tested it, first field. I know that that designer has put that game through an acid test. That that game has, in order to hit the table there at one of those events, or multiple events, then that game has to have a certain level of strength to survive that and come back out again. Or um, or on a Kickstarter campaign, too. Yeah, you know, on a Kickstarter the, campaign, too. Yeah. The whole thing, you're all you're trying to do on a Kickstarter campaign is convince people that this game is good. You know, you're going to get it home, you're going to like it. And if you have anything like that that you can put on your page, it's just going to give you more and more credibility. I, and I have, I have been on the fence for some games, uh, looking at Kickstarter, and I scroll down, and they have the little unpub seal there, and I'm like, yeah, it's pushed me over. So it for, it has, uh, and I can go look in like the Unpub database and see which Unpubs it was out and how many times. And that gives you more confidence in the, the pedigree or the breeding, the development of that game. You now it's, it's like a pedigree for your game. Your game has been at you know, a protospiel and an Unpub event, and it's gone through these, these rounds of revisions. Okay. It, you know, you said you skip over the, uh, the sell sheet, but tell me a little bit about those. I'll shoot one more, too, because just, just for fairness, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I'm terrible at that. There's another guy on the East Coast, uh, Double Exposure, uh, and they run this thing called Metatopia, and it's a it's a game development con, uh, but it's paid. For Protospiel and Unspo events, they are paid, too. I paid to go to every Unpub Protospiel budget, but they're, they're super, like, not-for-profit, low-budget. These guys are a little higher budget, uh, and I went to one of their events, and I, I bought... Uh, but I bought six hours of playtesting time, or maybe it was eight hours, for 250 bucks. Uh, but what they do is they will give you, they have like a staff of 20 managing the events, and they will give you whatever demographics you want. So like, who do you want to test your game? Uh, I don't want uh, women over the age of 30. Okay, we'll send you five of those to playtest your game. And they'll do actually do it. So if you want to test a certain demographic or things like that, uh, th that kind of event may be worthwhile because the you're you're paying for the event management to be at a certain level where you can do some more things. Uh, I also want to mention that PAX, the PAX cons are now starting to have kind of these prototype zones and board game zones in them, and that's growing and maybe an opportunity to test your game at one of those as well. And our local con here, uh, Celesticon, just did a a Celesta Spiel. Protospiel within the con, kind of con within the con for prototype games, and more local cons are starting to do that as well. Um, SAC Anime now is, is developing that as part of their board game room, a, a prototype area as well. Okay. Uh, Jeremy said he wasn't going to talk about the, uh, the the press sheets, but or I mean the not excuse me the cell sheets. Cell sheets. But uh, go ahead and tell us what uh, your experience with that is. Uh, with cell sheets. Sure. Um, yeah, we we haven't really used them. Um, I know I know Jeremy has. I think you have a couple examples you could probably give, but um, they're a great idea. Um, so it, it'll just it'll it'll give you a very brief summary of the game. Um, if you have some art or some graphic designers card examples, you can put those there too. Um, but it, it's, it's things like you know the components, um, the number of players, you know the type of game, you know kind of what what very Jeremy, similar to the okay. what, what Jeremy puts on his boxes, his prototype boxes. Um, I, I've got two examples. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look. I think oh, so. This, we are going to convince you to talk about. It. <laughs> This is this is one of those things that uh, that a picture is worth a, a thousand words if, if you're if you're watching the video. And we'll we'll, we'll cut them into the video. So here's here's a sell sheet for a game called Secret Society, and in the picture it has uh, Richard and Brian there, and it tells you skill level, number of players, much like the box, but then it's still got these bullet points that tell about the theme, the components, the gameplay, and the contact information for the game. And I've got one more here. Uh, this one's for Pass the Paint. Uh, and again, it's the components. And this one, actually, I, I paid a graphic designer to do this yeah, one. Yeah, that's a really nice one. So it, it actually looks, it looks, it looks nice. Uh, I actually had someone who knows what they're doing beside it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a sell sheet just to give, give pretty much a one pager usually on on what the game is. Should be what one you page. Expect. Yeah, yeah. And let me give you like three contexts where where you would use a sell sheet and why mm -hmm. you want to. So context number one, we talked about earlier, convincing people to play your game. So now I'm at a protospiel or unpub event, or a local prototype meetup, and I can put the sell sheet on the game. Maybe I haven't made a nice box for it. You don't have to. You just make the sell sheet. The sell sheet is on the table next to my game. People can walk up and see the summary of what the game was all about right there on there. Or if I bump into a prospective publisher, that tells them everything they need to know about the game if they want to pick it up. This is for the publisher to remember the game and know the key, the key facts about the game. Uh, at many con major cons now, so at Gen Con, 
and at BGGCon, I'll be going to BGGCon soon, I signed up for three publisher speed datings at BGGCon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a table, I'm going to have a game laid out with a sell sheet, and every three minutes, a publisher is going to sit down at my table, and I'm going to have three minutes to pitch them my game and explain what it is, and they're going to take a sell sheet, and then they take notes on the back of it or write some things about it, uh, and then they'll decide if they want to follow up with me if they are interested in that game. Uh, if I'm going to an event like PAX, that may be very useful for that. Or let's say I am a publisher like Brian, and I have a game that I'm about to launch in Kickstarter, and I want to send out review copies to different reviewers, or to board game press and websites and podcasts, I can send them the sell sheet with the game, and this is like a, a you know a summary of all about the game in addition to the game. So they even if they don't have time to play it, they can read the sell sheet and talk about it, or at least be informed. Looks like a press release would be exactly yeah. So like a, a sell sheet is something that that I I haven't really used. Um, it's it's a great idea, and I think I think I should use it. Uh, but but what I do is put together a press kit. You know, because I'm not I'm not trying to sell a game to anybody usually other than I guess I guess you know players and that kind of thing. But I I'm I'm just putting together a press kit or a press release so that it has um, the summary, kind of the one pager, but then also usually more images, more cards, more uh, more that you know something where you could write an online article and then just kind of kind of pull write a blog images. post exactly. They I mean, say that every blog post should have a photo. Yep. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Even if it's like a stock photo of a flower. You gotta have a photo. <laughs> right. So right. if I get a press kit and it's got a bunch of cool images of this game on there, like a big robot or yeah. a scary looking witch or yep. whatever, yep. then I can you know, I throw those images up in my blog post and it's a lot more engaging for my readers. Yep. And I get content for my blog. You know, I'm doing my, 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 my game content blog and it's like I'm gonna run out of ideas to write about. Yep. So now here's this guy sending me something I can write about with great images. Hey, great! Yep. This is you know, Maybe a post for today or this week, then they'd be very useful. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to convince um, journalists, you know, anyone who has a, a blog or does videos or articles, reviews, anything like that. I'm trying to get them to to take my game seriously, so that they they're like I they're excited about playing it. Um, they'll write an article, hopefully do you know a video, and then I can use that to to put on Kickstarter campaigns or just get buzz going for a game. So how, that's what I'm trying. How to long is your press kit? Like, what, what's what's in your press kit? Um, it really depends on the game, but I guess I would say you know if if you talk about kind of a one pager that you would have, you know, a press kit would probably be for me about two pages of kind of description, components, that kind of thing, and then usually a couple pages of images too that they can use. So it's like just I mean you really short. you it is short. It's definitely usually short. Yeah, but I guess if I if I made a a, a more in depth game. Then maybe I would have more, where I would take a picture of every single component that you have in the game, you know, and then have that there in case they want to, you know, write about, you know, the the dice that we use, and then they can have a nice, nice, good, high quality picture of the dice and in action, that kind of thing. So it really depends on the game, but for me, you know, it's they're they're usually pretty short. I would say probably maybe three. Shorter three is better. Less is more. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yep. true, true story. I went to publish speed dating at Gen Con, and I had the sell sheet, and I paid my graphic designer guy I know for two hours of his time to make this sheet for me. Uh, that was definitely a worthwhile investment. Mm -hmm. And I think I had the best looking sell sheet there. Other guys are handing out like four pages of typed text. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. no one, no one's going to look at that. I don't right. want to read your book report, thanks. No. <laughs> no. It's like a resume, but yeah. it should be more visual because it yep. should have components yep. and photos of your game. Yep. So it's very visual, very appealing. So when I, when I make a sell sheet, I try to make it half images, half text. And the text is big white space, bullet points, you know, low density text. So it's very readable, very approachable. So it's memorable, and people are actually likely to, to read it. And I actually have had publishers contact me months later, uh, and and they say, "Hey, I ran across this sell sheet for the so and so game, and I'm interested in that. Can you send me a copy?" Uh, and that was very useful. The person I had not talked to about that game saw the sell sheet from someone else months later, and it was enough for them to reach out and contact me. Okay, that's fantastic. I also want to mention the component list on there and why that's important. So at yeah. Gen Con uh, this year, in 2014, I did not do publisher speed dating, but what one of my buddies, Chris Castaneda, who was a local game developer, did. Uh, and he said one of the biggest trends of the publisher speed dating is publishers were looking for smaller, good cop, good, bad cop sized games. They were looking for like this 54 to 60 card games. And that was the one of the things that the, the component list can be very valuable to a publisher they can look and they go, so I can pass the paint, and it gives you the card quantity on there, 108 cards, exactly what it is. Uh, and so I have another game, the Secret Society game, that's under 60 cards. Uh, and so if a publisher is looking for a, a, a game to fit like a particular niche, they can say, oh, 
this this game is the, what I'm looking for. This is the right size game for what I want to do. And the components also give them an idea of how much it's going to cost to produce the game. Absolutely. We talked earlier about pricing your game and cost the game. So if you can define the components clearly, you'll have an idea how much it's going to cost to produce your game on Kickstarter, and a potential publisher is going to have an idea of how much it's going to cost to produce your game as well. Yep, and then you don't waste anyone's time either. I can look I can look at a component list and say, like, yeah, we might publish that, or no way. Can't do it. It's too big. You know, yep. It's, yep, yep. What, what's the most important information for you if someone pitches you a game? Uh, what, what are you looking at first? Um, let's see. I guess it would be the style. Um, you know, we're we're right now. We have we're, our niche is is social games and okay. often hidden identity games. And but really, just something my where, favorite genre. Yeah, where people are going <laughs> to sit at a table and then have a social experience, not go through rules, um, and you know, eventually have somebody with a certain amount of victory points that is mm -hmm. more than anyone else. So. Uh, that's what we look for. So if someone can pitch me a game like that and tell me that's the style of game that this is, then that that really interests me. But then also the size too. You know, you can have that kind of game with uh, many many components, and it's going to be really expensive. And that's not something as a small publisher I want to get into right now. You know, maybe down the road, but um, you know, it needs to be a, a pretty small game too. All right, I'm going to cut them off right there, and we're going to continue on with this in a part three next week. Uh, for the time being, I've been Richard New, this is Jeremy Commander, and Brian Hink. Uh, you can contact us at theforbiddenlimb at gmail.com or go to theforbiddenlimb.com for uh, our website. Um, we want to hear from you because we're, we're lonely. Absolutely. Please, <laughs> write us a letter. This guy. Tweet look, us. Look at him. Comment. <laughs> oh, my God. Even if it's the tr most trollest thing I've ever heard, I still want to hear it. <laughs> I've got a wife. Welcome. I'm fine. But <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, you, Brian's fine. But, uh, I'll, I'll let Jeremy <laughs> filter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, and we will be back for part three in a week.